So we are approaching the holiest of weeks in the Christian calendar. And that is the week from Palm Sunday to Easter. So we're going to turn our attention to that week. We are going to look, first of all, at the crucifixion of Christ and then his resurrection. Today we're focusing on what we can learn from the last seven things that Jesus said. The last seven, when we say words, we think it's going to be one word. But there are, they are really sayings. So we're looking at the seven last sayings of Christ. And then next week, I'm going to teach about the resurrection and how Christ appears to men and to women and, and how those actions look. So we're going to take a deep dive into the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus to see what we can learn. So let's get into the scenario uh, right before the crucifixion of Jesus. The Jewish leaders have condemned Jesus, but it is only through the Roman authority that, that, they, that Jesus can be killed. So it's the Jews who've come up with a lot of evidence, who've been stalking him and staking him out and testing him, but it is the Romans who have the authority and the power to kill. So Jesus now is standing before the Roman governor, Pilate. And so Pilate now has this opportunity to make a decision about what will happen to Jesus. There's a problem, though. Matthew 27, verse 23 tells us why. What crime has he committed? Pilate can't find a reason to condemn Jesus. Well, of course not, because Jesus is innocent. Pilate was walking on eggshells. He's trying to please everyone. He has a decision to make while he's walking on eggshells, and we want to see what he is going to choose, which route he is going to go walking on eggshells. Are you walking on eggshells with anybody in your life where you're, you just don't know which way to go? What do I need to do? <clears throat> what do I need to say? There are a lot of people that I'm trying to please and satisfy, and I want to choose well. Well, we can then understand Pilate's situation. Pilate has to choose how he's going to walk on the eggshells. Egg God guides us through the eggshell walk. He, we, he, we turn to him. Pilate didn't do that. Instead, Pilate defers the judgment to the people. He lets the crowd choose who is going to be put to death. Are they going to pick Jesus or this revolutionary man named Barabbas? Well, they chose to release the criminal. They chose him over the innocent Jesus, and Pilate caves in to the crowd. So then the next action that we see is that the Roman soldiers take Jesus out. And this is a grim scene that plays out before our eyes. We see that they are flogging him. They are mocking him. They're treating him with scorn and derision, and they're, they're calling out names to him. And they mock him, saying, oh, he is the king of the Jews, and there's much laughter. But what the truth is, he is the king of kings. We read in Matthew 27, verse 29, they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. And then they knelt before him in mockery and taught it, taunted, Hail, King of the Jews. They walk him then up this hill of Golgotha. It's right outside the city gates of Jerusalem. It's not that far of a walk, but it is up a hill. And there is a lot of pain in carrying the cross and moving upward to that, uh, that place where they now hang Jesus on a cross. And so while he is there on the cross, we're going to listen to the words that he is saying to the crowd. You know, 
We all have last words. Sometimes they're intentional. They're very calculated or they're very intentional goodbyes. Other times they're just whatever the last words that we're going to speak. If you could choose, what would your last words be? We're going to delve into what Jesus chose to say in his intentional words. P.T. Barnum was the, the greatest showman on earth. And on his deathbed, his last words were, what were today's receipts? <laughs> well, that was intentional, and we can tell what was on his mind. On March 14, 1883, Karl Marx, one of the founders of communism, died. Well, his housekeeper had gone into him and said, tell me your last words and I will write them down. And Marx replied, get out. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. Well, Marx had said plenty, hadn't he? He had said a lot of words and most of them were not good. Well, let's learn from what Jesus said. Jesus didn't do a lot of talking on the cross. He was silent for most of the hours that he was there, except for a very few recorded words. But these seven last sayings give us a window into who Jesus really is. They give us an insight into his soul. They give us a way to understand what was ultimately important to him when he was dying on the cross. So let's consider the scene on Golgotha, that dark and foreboding Friday afternoon, with, with reverence as we consider him on that cross. What we're going to see is incredible love. We're going to see determination, humanity, and divinity. We're going to see an intimate relationship with his mother, we're going to see an intimate relationship with his father, and we're going to see trust and reunion. So let's dig in. I've given you one word to ponder as we're looking at these sayings, and the first word we're going to ponder is forgiveness. We're reading now from Luke 23, verses 32 through 34, two other men both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Well, the scene all around this at the time of the cross is very insensitive and it was unfeeling. First of all, the soldiers begin with this cruel process of nailing the criminal to the cross. And then they hoist him up on that cross and the cross is swaying forward and then it goes back until it is secured with the wedges at the bottom that hold it upright in the hole. And then when that task is done, they sit around at the base waiting for the criminal to die. And sometimes this can take days. So to pass the time, they begin to gamble. They uh, decide by a casting of lots, a game that was played to pick the winners, and in this case, to show who will get the victim's last possessions. So that is the scene. But in the middle of that, that playing of the games at the bottom of the cross, comes this astounding and powerful word from that criminal in the center cross. Father, forgive them, for they just don't know what they're doing. So in his last hour, Jesus is saying a prayer, a request to his Abba, Father. It's remarkable that the first words were not about himself. What might your prayer have been? I know I would say, God help me, would be my prayer. But 
Jesus' prayer is one of complete unselfishness. He's concerned really about the people who are responsible for crucifying him. He's asking God to forgive the people who just don't know what they're doing. Do, do you have any people in your life that you've tried to minister to? You've tried to help. You've tried to guide them along the way. Or you tried to actually witness to someone and, and lead someone to the Lord. But they reject you, perhaps ridicule you, perhaps turn away from you, perhaps slam the door in your face, so to speak. But God says, don't give up. Don't give up on them. <clears throat> Forgive them and keep praying for them because Jesus loves them. So the first thing we see from this word of forgiveness is that God is love. To the very end, Jesus loves. Well, who are the they that he's praying for? Let's consider the possibility. First of all, there are those soldiers who are around there at the foot of the cross. The Romans uh, routinely at the, the death site. They destroy human life. That's the, their job at this point. They have been following orders. Only after the fact did they realize what they had done. So it could have been those soldiers there he was including in this act of forgiveness. Oh, but think about Pilate, perhaps another candidate, maybe the best candidate at this point, against all law. He had given the order for crucifixion. Above the law... He decided to vote with the people. He had found Jesus innocent of the crimes with which he had been charged. Yet he was pressured by the Jewish leaders and he feared a riot. And so he felt forced against his better judgment. So he signed that death warrant and then publicly washed his hands of it. Perhaps Jesus was forgiving Pilate for the weakness in his character. And then there were those chief priests and those scribes who were the real driving force behind the crucifixion. Remember back when Jesus cleaned out that temple? And the chief priests and the scribes were the prime factors behind the crucifixion. They were driving that. Remember back to the scene when Jesus cleaned out the temple because the money changers were in there charging an extreme exchange rate. Well, those were the chief priests and the scribes that were running that, and they then determined that they needed to kill Jesus. Well, behind the scenes, they ended up paying off Judas for his insider betrayal. They sent the temple soldiers to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They tried to get people to falsely testify against Jesus before the Sanhedrin. They're the ones that brought his case before Pilate, and they're the ones that stirred up the crowd when Pilate was asking for a vote. It may just have been those chief priests and scribes that Jesus was also forgiving. And then there are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were early enemies of Christ. Jesus' plain teaching about the kingdom of God offended them. And the Sadducees then sought to discredit him. The Pharisees were the first to actively plot against Jesus. It might be that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the recipients of this plea of mercy. And then there's the rest of us. Jesus died for us and all of the other people who were living at the time and all those who've lived ever since. He is the one who died for our sins and our weaknesses. Jesus wanted to forgive us for the sins that sent him to the cross. What a savior who would want to forgive all of those in front of him and for centuries to come. Sometimes in our relationships with others, the only thing more difficult than humbling ourselves to ask forgiveness is truly granting it to others to fully forgive. 
and to not let resentments continue to linger inside of us. Jesus' last words remind us that God's forgiveness knows no boundaries. We need God's help and grace to help forgive in such a way. What do we see about Jesus? He was practicing what he preached, didn't he, about forgiveness. And what do we ask ourselves? We ask, do we place limits on what we are willing to forgive? Our second word now is salvation. I'm reading from Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. This is one of the most amazing prayers and promises in scripture. Hanging on the cross right next to Jesus was a criminal on the left and a criminal on the right. Scripture doesn't tell us what crimes they committed, but know this, that the, the punishment of crucifixion was not for those who committed petty crimes. These were hardcore criminals on either side of them. I'm wondering about that man that said, what, what what are you doing? We have sinned. We've had these same sins. And Jesus, remember me. Who was it that talked to him at some point and told him about the faith? Never give up on the people that you have been pouring into. Never give up on that lost brother or that lost sister or mother or child, that wayward child. Never give up on them because there will be an opportunity in their future to come to know the living Lord just as it happened for the criminal. Somebody poured into him because he knew the truth of the gospel. One of them, though, on the other hand, takes up name calling and jeering. You, the Christ, aren't you? Just come on and save us. The thief is making fun of what he saw was the inability of this man and his claims of the Messiah. But the second criminal may be condemned to death, but he hasn't lost his faith. For he asked the other criminal, don't you fear God? We're punished justly, but he isn't. This man knew something. And in his final hour, he turns to Christ and says, remember me. Remember me. I want to go where you're going. He had been condemned to death, but this man had faith. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about this. Jesus' disciples at this point have fled. Or they're standing along a, a, a little piece away in the shadows on this dark Friday. But here on the cross, this condemned man understands that Jesus holds his promise for a future. It's never too late. What a promise Jesus gives this believing thief. Presence with Christ in paradise. Jesus' crucifixion means salvation. It means it for those who repent and believe. Don't give up praying for people. I'm sure there are people in your life you've been praying for. I'm sure there are people in your life who've wandered away from the faith. I'm sure there are family members and friends that you just don't know if they'll ever get it. This story tells us there is always hope and that it is the will of God that they be saved. Keep praying and holding on to the promise 
that they can be with Christ in paradise. This was a hardcore criminal. Those who were watching would never have dreamed that this man could make a profession of faith in Christ. But he did, and Jesus forgave him and gave him a beautiful promise for his future. Salvation is the second word. Our third word is all about relationship. This is one of the most tender scenes that we see in the last words. And we're reading now from John 19, verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Of the four gospel writers, John is the only one who records Mary's presence there at the cross. But it would be expected that she would be there. The Jews were in Jerusalem for Passover, and we know Mary was faithful to the Jewish faith. And now her son is in trouble. He's been arrested, he's been tried, he's been condemned, and now he is dying. Surely Mary chose to be right there close to her son. Let's recall that when Jesus was a newborn baby, they took him to the temple. And Simeon was in the temple. That prophet gave a prophecy at Jesus' dedication in the temple. And we read in Luke 2, Luke 2 verse 35, he told Mary that one day a sword will pierce your own soul too. He told her when Jesus was only weeks old that she would have something tragic that she would witness with her own son, and it would pierce her, her to her very soul. She's near him now, and that prophecy has come true. Her heart is broken. I love that she's there with her best friends. Her girlfriends are right there with her. The women of worth in Jerusalem have gathered, and they're walking through this journey with her. And Jesus looks down. He looks at his mother, not as mother, but as woman. And it's translated in the NIV as dear woman. It's a more formal address. But once again, Jesus was being very intentional. He was thinking in this moment of the Jewish family law. And as Mary's firstborn, Jesus is responsible through the law for her welfare. It is his job to ensure that she has a place to live and, and food to eat and that she's taken care of because there is no husband at this point. And Jesus looks down at her and says, take a look at the new son. I'm granting this honor. And he's looking over at his friend, his closest friend, John. And he says, John, now look at your mother. And on that cross, he unites the two. And then John took that seriously. John took care of Mary for the rest of her life. He took her into his home. He trusted John dearly for that. Look at the extent of Jesus' love. He's, he's here dying. He's in agony. He's grasping, gasping for each breath, and he sees his mother, the one who had comforted him in all his little cuts and bangs and bruises of childhood. I'm sure he had to endure a lot of teasing and a lot of taunts. Can you imagine growing up as the perfect child in a home with other children? Can you imagine? I wonder if Mary was tempted to say, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> He's perfect. Can you imagine? 
When he was a boy, he would run home, and she would instantly put her loving and protective arms around him, comforting in him, him in that mother love. But now she sees him. She's at the foot of the cross, heart broken, weeping, inconsolable. And his heart goes out to her. Rather than being consumed by an understandable concern for his own welfare, he's really touched by others. He never leaves his sense of responsibility, even in his last days. What do we learn about him through this? He loved his family. He took care of his family. He felt a sense of responsibility. What's our takeaway from this when it comes to relationships? We have responsibility in relationships, don't we? We have a duty. We have obligations toward those we love. Are we protecting those? Are we caretaking those moments with the people that we love? Relationships were very important to Jesus. And that was the theme of his third word. And then we get to the fourth word, and, and this takes a hard turn for us because the word is abandonment. We're reading now from Mark 15, verses 33 through 35. It's also found in Matthew. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And that translated means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Now, remember, Elijah was a prophet that was very important to Jews. And they thought for some reason that he was calling on to this great prophet from the Old Testament. But that was just a misunderstanding. He was actually calling to his father in his pain and his sense of abandonment. It's in the middle of the seven last sayings. It's Jesus' lowest point physically. However, there is what we could consider a theological high point here in the crucifixion. The early crowds now have disappeared because it's a long time in waiting for someone to die. An eerie darkness has descended upon the entire area. We could call it a crushing gloom has set in. And in this fourth word on the cross, Jesus goes back to what he knew in Scripture. Think on that just a moment. At his lowest point, Jesus turned to Scripture. What a message for us. He goes back and he looks at Psalm 22 and says these words, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Do you ever call out scripture in your pain and you go back and you find that scripture and you, and you call it out and you pray it back to God? This is what he was doing. This is what he felt at, the po at that point, abandoned. The fact that he is praying, my God, shows that he still trusts his heavenly father. So before we begin to think that he felt abandoned, alone, and not having a God, that is not what it says. He calls on his God. But what seems to have been broken here is the intimacy of fellowship that he had been experiencing. That word forsaken is a hard word for us to even think about. In the Greek... It meant forsake, abandon, or desert. But what we know from Scripture is God does not leave us. He does not abandon us. At the same time, often we feel 
the sense of abandonment. So can we hold those two things in, in conjunction with each other? He had not been abandoned, but he felt that. He felt that sense of distance from God. Hebrews 13, 5 promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. But clearly, Jesus senses that he is forsaken. In these moments, as evil men were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do to Jesus, our Lord expresses a feeling of being forsaken, being alone. God placed the sins of the world on his son. And Jesus, for a time, felt the desolation of being unconscious of his father's presence. Not that he didn't trust his father. I'm going to say that again because I hope you clue in to the significance of that. God had placed all the sins of the world on his son. And Jesus, for this time, felt a, the desolation of being unconscious, unaware of his father's presence. It wasn't that he didn't trust his father. There's another possible reason that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This verse was imprinted on his mind from Psalm 22. And the psalm, the psalmist understood the forsaking of God was not abandonment. But it was a time of lifting his sovereign protection according to his divine plan. So that the threats of the enemy could be carried out in fulfillment of the prophecy. So do you see the, the hedge of that protection in that moment had to be lifted so that the act could be carried out and the prophecy could be fulfilled. Even while experiencing the agony of the cross, Jesus was teaching the crowds and proving yet again that he was the Messiah. We are seeing also his sight of humanity and we're seeing that he was very aware that the prophecy had to be fulfilled. He is in agony. He is in pain. He is suffering. So here's a lesson to us. Here's a message to us on that fourth word. Whenever we too feel pain and we feel the suffering and we feel at a loss and we feel separated, Jesus knows how we feel. We can trust him. We can turn to him. What he wants us to do is turn our pain into prayer. That's what he did. When he felt abandoned, Jesus turned his pain into prayer. There's comfort in that. And then we move on to the fifth word. And the theme of this one is about the distress that Jesus felt on the cross. Now, the, it's in, near the end of his life on earth. He has been on the cross now for six hours. It's, it's hard for Jesus to even get a breath. They call this death by crucifixion, but really what it was, the result of that, is that he couldn't breathe. That's what happens in the end. You lose the ability to breathe. It's suffocation. So he's hanging from his arms. He has to pull himself up each time he wants to breathe. His shoulders must be aching. His mouth is parched. And he is exhausted and in distress. <clears throat> but he doesn't want to die without his final words. And so in his humanity, he knows that he needs to drink something to wet his lips for his final effort to talk. So let's read in John 19, verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, 
You see, the purpose of his speaking these words was knowing that it's over and the scripture is going to be fulfilled and he has to proclaim it. He said these three words, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Well, the scripture was once again fulfilled here. It's in a psalm of lamentation written by David. It's psalm 69, verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Let's took it, take a look at what that is. This vinegar, also called the wine, uh, it, it was what was a container of wine vinegar doing there anyway, we, we want to ask. What was that about? Well, it was called Posca, P-O-S-C-A. It was a drink popular with the Roman soldiers of the day, and it was made by taking sour wine vinegar and mixing it with water. So it was watered down. It was very inexpensive. It was considered more quench-thirsting than just water. It was used to prevent scurvy. It also killed harmful bacteria in the water. And the vinegary taste made bad-smelling water more pleasant to drink. So that's why that was there at the foot of the cross. The soldiers had brought it with them to sustain themselves during the crucifixion. They weren't getting drunk on it just using it to quench their thirst. And then we see in Scripture the sponge there. When Jesus indicated that he was thirsty, the soldiers used a sponge and they dipped it in the Pascha to uh, quench his thirst. Now, sponges were a part of the soldier's kit. The Roman soldiers had a kit of things they carried with them, and, and sponges were in there. Seems very odd, doesn't it? Well, sponges were found along the Mediterranean coast, and they were used uh, in ancient times to put a pad under the soldier's helmet. Soldiers also used sponges as their drinking vessels. No doubt one of the soldiers must have had a, a sponge. And so they dipped that sponge into the Pascha, and they then are going to offer that to Jesus. Uh, the hyssop is mentioned here. John makes a point of specifying the hyssop plant. That is a small bush. It has blue flowers. It's very aromatic, and it was common in that area. It was also what was used to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost at Passover. Think of the beautiful significance of that. The hyssop plant used on the doorpost at Passover is what they are going to use to hoist up a sponge filled with that liquid, that Pascha, for Jesus to drink. The end is near. So Jesus drank enough of it to moisten his parched throat so he could say the last words of triumph so that those words could be he heard all over the hills of Golgotha. What do we see about Jesus in this word? First and probably of greatest importance, his words, I thirst, reminds us that Jesus had a physical human nature, a human need. He was in distress, and he needed to parch the thirst. Secondly, his words, I thirst, reminds us of Jesus' knowledge of the Scripture concerning his, concerning his suffering and death. He was wanting to fulfill the prophecy at every step. There's just a wonderful study I've done before on the prophecies that came true at the resurrection, the prophecies that came true on the birth of Jesus. And we're seeing that prophecy is coming true. He's, he knows his scripture and he knows it has to happen and he's making sure that it's going to come true. The third, when he says, I thirst, it's to strengthen himself 
and ease his throat so that he can cry out the final words with a loud voice. He was summoning himself, everything within him, to complete the task because Jesus had words to say. We can be assured that Jesus understands our distress. He wants to satisfy our thirst. He wants to satisfy our need for strength and energy when we are depleted. Has anybody felt that? Even recently, do you sometimes get up and say, I just don't know how I'm going to go through this day. There's just too much. Too many people counting on me. I'm not sleeping well. I haven't had enough to eat. I, I'm walking on eggshells. I have so many chores to do. I don't think I can make it through. I thirst. Jesus says, I understand that. And I can quench it. I will give you the strength and the energy to get through the task you have at hand. And you know what else? I can help you do it boldly with a loud voice. That's his promise. He wants us to lean into that and to know that that's what he can give us. And then look for what he's telling us to do with it. What is he telling us? Oh, sister, he says, if you want the energy and the strength to carry on, you're going to have to figure out how to sleep. You're going to have to figure out what you need to be eating. You're going to have to figure out how much you need to be drinking. You're going to have to figure out what words you need to pass on to somebody. You're going to need to be digging into that scripture and finding my will and my way. You're going to have to get your courage and your strength up. So you're going to have to do everything you can humanly to get it figured out. Do you see where Jesus started? He was thirsty. He had to get the physical needs of the body met at that moment to carry on with the words he needed to say. What a message that is for us in our distress. He also models the importance of knowing scripture in our weakest time. 2 Corinthians 12 reminds us that our strength can be made perfect in our weakness. Our strength can be made perfect in our weakest times. When we lean on him, when we lean into him, and we listen to what he's telling us to do, sometimes it is so simple, and we want to make it so hard. When we are seeking to do God's will and his plan, he wants us to find the simplest path there, because that gets us there quicker. Sometimes it's having our bodily needs met our body, having our bodies filled. And then he says, you're ready to search your soul and do the next right thing. And then we move to the sixth word. It's a word of triumph. It doesn't sound like it, but it is a triumphant tone. We read in John 19, verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus' journey began in this simple stable in the city of David 30 some years before. And now it's finished. And it's a triumphant ending. Well, what was that mission he had? Why did he even come? Let's go back and look at how Jesus defined his mission, how he defined his purpose, and why he came. We read in his commissioning statement that he read from the book of Isaiah when he stood up in the temple, and he said, I have come to, and this is a series of things that he said, I've come to preach the gospel to the poor. I have come to bring life. I have come to destroy the devil's work. I have come to bring fire upon the earth. I have come to testify to the truth. 
Those are things Jesus said all throughout his ministry. This is what I've come to do. This is my purpose. This is my plan. Each of these seems like a way to fulfill an ultimate purpose in life. Each one of those was part of his mission on earth to get to this point to save us all from our sins. His job was to go out into the world and preach the gospel of salvation. He's still preaching it. And he said, it is finished. Those three words come from the Greek root word, telos. And that means end. It means a termination point. Get this. It didn't mean he gave up. It didn't mean he said, I give. It meant his purpose was complete. It is finished. I've done what I said I would do. This wasn't a cry of defeat. It was one that was a victory call, a victory cry at the end. What does this tell us about Jesus? Jesus lived for his purpose. He knew it, and he knew when it was finished. What can we learn from that? First of all, he wants us to live lives of purpose. You know, if you haven't spent time doing this, I encourage you to examine your purpose. What are you here for? Why am I here? I, I, I talk with women frequently who grapple with that. I really don't know what my purpose is. I really don't know what I'm to do. I just get up every day and I do the same things. I have these tasks and these chores and these responsibilities and I just kind of go through this cycle. But I don't really know my purpose. And God says, we need to know that purpose. You need to know who you are and how I created you. I've given you skills and I've given you a personality. I've given you gifts, spiritual gifts. I've given you a situation. I've given you circumstances in your life. And that's all for a purpose so that you can glorify me and that you can be an encouragement to other people. It's as broad as that. Live for me on purpose every day in whatever circumstances you're facing. And sometimes that involves very specific things. When you put your spiritual gifts in there, it involves specific things. Because what he's called me to do in my purpose is to lead and to teach. That's what he says I created you to do. And I've given you the personality to do it. I've given you the skills to do it. You have an education that says how to do it. And now you trust on me, trust in me, and I'll show you how to do that. And he says, and you'll be fulfilled. You'll live in joy and you'll live in peace if you do that. And I'm not unusual. Oh, well, some of you say that I am. But I'm not unique in that regard. Everyone in the room, everyone watching this can say the very same thing. He called me for a purpose, and here's who I am. I'm this choleric, called to teach and called to lead, called to sow good seeds into people, called to live in joy and peace and kindness and goodness, practice patience. He says, that's what I've created you to do. Now, how well are you going to do it? It's up to you. I get to choose every day how I'm going to do that, how it's going to look. We all do. Once again, this summer, I'll be spending three weeks in the summer teaching you how to live in your purpose. It's all about finding who you are in Christ. What are your gifts and your talents? What are your spiritual gifts? And we'll be looking at that, how he called you. I've taught this before in the past, and our officer said it's time to do that again, so I'm spending and I hope that you'll be a part of that. I haven't decided which three weeks. You can come in and go out. If you can't be there all three, come when you can. It's okay. Jesus lived on purpose. He wants us to live with purpose on purpose. Unless Jesus had a purpose, a mission to complete, those words would have had little meaning if he didn't have those. The second thing, living lives on purpose requires us to focus on our priorities. 
instead of living what I would call scattershot lives. We are to be marksmen, marks women <laughs> that aim carefully at our target and we make our shots count. This requires focus and discipline. Sometimes we have to get our eyes adjusted, don't we? Some of you may not know I like to shoot. I like to target practice. I haven't done it since I've had my eyes fixed. But here's what I know. When I look down that barrel and I'm looking at the target, I have to have laser beam focus if I'm going to hit the center. Sometimes I have to close one eye in order to do it. He wants us to find our priorities, get laser beam focused on what we're supposed to be doing. That means we have to say no to some choices so that we can say yes to some other opportunities. And third, to be able to say it is finished as Jesus did, our lives must be marked by obedience. Jesus is God, but in his earthly ministry, he willingly obeyed. Finally, to say it's finished, we must be willing to suffer to achieve God's purpose for our lives. This is not an easy path, is it? It's hard some days. It's hard because we're walking on eggshells a lot, aren't we? It's hard to please people. Sometimes we have to live in some disappointment. We have to have a little suffering. And Jesus modeled how to do that. We want a triumphant end in our own lives. Look at what happens with the seventh word. It is a reunion. Luke 23, verse 44 tells us, It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Under the Romans, crucifixion was often a very long, drawn-out process, and that was the idea. A prolonged, torturous death for criminals would not only inspire horror in the hearts of the people, but also be this public reminder that it's dangerous to go against the Roman government. Criminals would often last days before they finally died On this day, uh, any surviving criminals then would be killed by the breaking of their legs. Their bodies would be removed from the cross. And some arrangement must be made for what to do with them after that. Well, in addition to the sun not shining, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This is one of those miracles that is really hard for us to grasp. So I want us to dig in and look at how this, this played out in the Holy of Holies. The curtain mentioned is that inner, inner curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place. There are actually two curtains that were 60 feet long and 30 feet wide, and they were as thick as a, the palm of a man's hand. They were woven in 72 separate squares, and they were joined together. That's a pretty sturdy curtain, isn't it? Think of the force that would have been required to tear this massive curtain in two. Perhaps the earthquake caused the fall of a rafter to begin the vertical rip that went from top to bot bottom. Now that's how we can understand it if we don't think it was just a plain old miracle. We can have that understanding of what happened with the earthquake. The barrier now between God and humanity was split in two. No longer 
would we have to send a priest in to speak for us to God? This was a direct line because the curtain was torn in two. The words that Jesus spoke, into your hands I commit my spirit, were taken once again from the Psalms. Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy written in Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. This was part of an evening prayer used daily by the devout Jews. They knew this. They wanted to go to bed committing their spirit to God. It's a model for us. Once again, now I lay me down to sleep. Let me commit my spirit to you, O oh Father. Forgive me for what I have said or done at the, throughout the day, knowingly or unknowingly. However I have hurt others or hurt you, forgive me, because I want to be connected to your spirit right now, Father. What a beautiful way to end the day. It was a loud voice, scarcely what one would expect from a man about to die, but Jesus seemed determined that his words are going to be heard as a testimony that can be recorded. His last words are firm and they are confident. What do we learn from our Jesus in this? As he lets go of life on earth, he trusts his eternal destiny into his Father's everlasting arms. Jesus knows the Father and knows there is life with the Father beyond death. That's our hope. As a devout Jew, he had prayed this prayer as part of his evening prayer every day of his life. Isn't it beautiful that he ended his life the way he ended his days? Now at the end of the life, he lets go of human life in order to embrace life with the Father. When we place ourselves in God's arms, we'll be close to him. We'll be snuggled up right next to him through the power of God's spirit. And we'll share in the joy that Jesus felt with his reunion with his father. Fortunately, this is not the end of the story because we serve a risen Lord. You have to come back. Next week, anyway, because we're going to look at the resurrection and we're going to see what we can learn about the choices Jesus made in his appearances. We're going to see how he left the tomb and what he said and what he did. This is that beautiful season of Lent where we are looking toward the cross and we're looking toward the resurrection. Let's commit to renew our faith and to deepen our relationship with God by reflecting and meditating on the greatest sermon he ever preached, his seven last words. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words. What beautiful reminders they are for us. Thank you for being an intentional God. A God who wanted to send his son to say these words to be recorded for all history. So that we would find hope in our own daily existence. And, and see the promise we have for a reunion with you. Thank you so much for this promise. Help us today. And always to live in your purpose, on purpose, as your son did. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.